welcome to our Friday night Bible study on Good Friday. This is the first Friday that we do this. So give yourselves a round of applause for being here. This is awesome. There's a, there's a tension for Friday nights because they're coveted between all of us, correct? It's Friday night. We want to relax. We want to enjoy the week of hard labor. And Friday nights are, in a way, sacred to many of us. We just rather stay home and relax, eat good food, and watch a good movie. But today is Good Friday. This is a day that, that lives in history and marks a starting point for those who have come to Christ and have been forgiven by Jesus Christ, the man. It's interesting to note that in a country like the United States that has shifted their attention from Jesus in a drastic way, some way, somehow, they still commemorate Good Friday. If you take a look at the, if you work at a bank, perhaps you probably had the day off. Or if you work at any kind of government agency, you probably had the day off. Wall Street took the day off today. The world, the United States specifically, that has shifted away from Christ, we still somehow celebrate his death. Well, today, that's precisely what we will be speaking on and precisely what I want to make sure you understand. Every time we come to a Good Friday service, it's more than a mystical element of ooh, solemn assembly or some type of uh, feel-good uh, night. This is, in a way, a moment to reflect on what Christ did. Specifically, on the violent nature of his death. Now, that rubs us the wrong way at times, especially in our modern culture. To know that someone was beaten, someone was murdered, someone was dragged, spit on for somebody else. Is that really what the Bible teaches and does it really mean that God, the Father, sent Jesus, the Son, to actually suffer that for people like us? Well, that's what we must understand from a biblical perspective. The only thing that we're going to do today is what we'll do every Good Friday. Is give us a good understanding and an overall summary of why Jesus had to die. Think about it. The entire Christian religion, if you want to say, you could include probably some aspects of Roman Catholicism. And we base our fundamental faith on the fact that a man that lived roughly 2,000 years ago died. And as we got to see the video, as the scripture was read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we also believe that he resurrected. Now that's a little bit like confusing at times for our modern nature and for our modern sensitivities of really does some, can someone really come back to life after they die? We have to come to an examination of our deep inner belief system. Do we really believe that Jesus Christ died and that he resurrected? If we don't believe that, then we could just really brush aside Good Friday and really just celebrate the fact that we have a day off from work and look forward to all the Easter candy that we will eat come Sunday morning. But if it is true, and if what the Bible presents is really true, then we have to understand why Christ dies. We have to understand why there is this shedding of blood. I don't know if you were able to pick up on the songs that we were singing today, but they spoke a lot about blood. Now, rarely do you ever listen to the radio and turn something on on whatever modern radio station you listen to. I'm from the old school, so I remember B96 was still a thing back in the day. I don't even know if that's... a uh, station anymore. But anyway, whatever you listen to, you, you're not listening to blood and, and enjoying this aspect of being washed in blood. 
unless, unless you're listening to some hardcore gangster rap. But in reality, we don't celebrate that. Violence isn't celebrated in our modern day culture. It is throughout some, some of our actions and deeds, but it generally isn't the case that we celebrate this. So why do we do it within the Christian church? And why do we do it in an aspect of worship? So this, my friends, is what we have to come to understand in light of Scripture, what it means for Jesus to have been offered as a sacrifice. Come this resurrection weekend, or what the United States calls Easter week or Easter Sunday and, and, and Good Friday, come this time of the year, we have to understand what we actually mean by sacrifice, by offering, by incest, by propitiation and the penalty of death. All of these are religious terminology that we have to understand in light of Scripture because they mean something if they are true. Now, I present this in this way because I fully know that there may be people here that may have a difficult time understanding or grasping or even believing that the Bible and what the Bible says about a man called Jesus actually did. It's a little bit of a far-fetched idea to believe that a man 2,000 years ago died and resurrected, flew into heaven, and promised to come back. It's a little bit far-fetched to believe that. However, that's what the Bible says. So, in a way, we have to understand why Jesus landed on Good Friday and what was the intent. And specifically, why was it planned that way? The Bible teaches us that there is a plan. So if you open your Bible up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to remind you of the verse that we read earlier. Now generally we go through an entire chapter or sequential verses as we preach. But today is Good Friday, so we're going to be jumping around quite a bit in Scripture so that we understand the plot line. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15... The Apostle Paul reminds us in verse 3 of his message. Or the entire chapter is a reminder of what he preaches. But then in verse 3 he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Once again, that last part, that Christ died for for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That means that it was premeditated. That means that it was planned. That means that the storyline was already figured out. And Jesus was going to be the main actor in the storyline. And part of the climax of the movie, per se, the climax of this story rests on the occurrence of Good Friday. Good Friday is the culmination of the storyline. That's where we base all of our faith. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Those are valuable truths that humanity must learn and accept in order to really understand the function of Jesus Christ. So Paul here never mentions that Jesus fed thousands of people. Paul never mentions the good social uh, exercises Jesus did for humanity. He doesn't mention necessarily the healing of the blind, the healing of the sick, and, and Jesus giving himself to the poor. He doesn't mention those aspects in 1 Corinthians 15, but what he does mention is what he does for humanity, which is the emphasis on humanity's greatest need. It isn't food. It isn't clothing. It isn't to be healed from a sickness. It is to be forgiven for our sins. That in turn makes us all guilty in one way or another of Christ's death. 
before Christ's death, we are already guilty of sin. And so Christ must come to free us from our sin. This is what the Bible depicts. This is what the Bible teaches us. So Jesus, here on the cross, cannot be seen as some poor, hopeless, helpless victim that hangs on a cross because people violently attacked him. He isn't simply some person that is misunderstood and has to be crucified because what he's been saying and preaching the entire time that he's been alive is nonsense and deserves death. He's not a hopeless, helpless victim here. He is fulfilling what he's called to do. Sacrifice and an offering for God in our place. Jesus offers himself with the intention of being accepted and received by God the Father. We'll read this throughout the entire Pentateuch, and I'll start saying some of these verses from the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament of what this terminology of sacrifice and offering actually means. In the Old Testament, we have this concept of sacrifice that provides God with a sweet aroma, a scent, a smell. And it's typically done in the Pentateuch as the Israel begins to bring God's sacrifices for their sin. For example, in Exodus chapter 29, verses 41, we'll read that they brought a grain and drink offering that was a pleasing aroma to the Lord. In Leviticus, we read in chapter 1, verse 9, that at the altar they bring a burnt offering. They offer food offering that will provide a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And again in Leviticus chapter 3, verse 16, all the priests that burn food on the altar, they do it as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Basically, God was pleased at the offering in, of a guilt offering that remediated the sin of the guilty party. And to God, it was a pleasing aroma. And not only is it written within, these law, within the law context, but the first time we see that God smells is in the book of Genesis after the flood. Genesis chapter 8 verse 20, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some, some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Verse 21, And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, he promised never to destroy humanity again in that way. It's a pleasing aroma, a pleasing smell. Sacrifices brought God were, were to God a pleasing aroma, a wonderful scent. Now, in, in the Old Testament, we have in 1 Samuel, the description of God smelling an offering and therefore accepting that offering in a sense for the forgiveness of sins. This is common in the Old Testament. But when we go to the New Testament, the only one that provides a wonderful smell to God the Father rests on Jesus Christ the Son. For instance, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is wonderful depiction, a summary of Christ's actual words and actions and deeds placed before us. Walk in love as Christ loved us. That speaks on the compassion Christ had for people like you and me. And you can say, well, hold on. Jesus never knew me. We're like years apart. Well, if Jesus is God, he most definitely knew you. He knows everything about you. Paul will later say that he knows the deepest secrets of our hearts. So yes, Jesus knows you and he knows your dirty little secrets. And in spite of all of that, Christ loved us. 
And then what does he do? He gives himself up, an offering. Here's that Old Testament terminology again. He gives himself up for us a fragrant offering. So what he does pleases God. He offers himself as a pleasing offering to God. Question is, would we be able to do the same? In the, no, in the New Testament, it is never mentioned that we can bring a pleasing aroma to God. Because there's no more sacrifices to do that can compare to the sacrifice Christ has done on the cross. So friend, there's nothing really you can do to bring that acceptable offering to God. Because Christ has already done it. Now this acceptable offering to God is meant in the relationship to sin. We can please God with our actions, with our deeds, with what we do, with how we walk, with how we talk. We can please God in many other ways. But we can never delete our sin the way Christ has done so already. That alone belongs to God. And so Good Friday, what we're celebrating today, stands in line with this wonderful redemptive plan and the storyline of salvation for us. So if you're here every Good Friday, we're going to repeat the same concept of a storyline. Because it must be known, and we cannot forget, that we were all within the plan foreordained by God in order to come to salvation by his work through Jesus Christ. There had to be done a sacrifice that no other person could have done except for the person of Jesus Christ. So we get this Good Friday. There's a reason why Good Friday comes into the picture and why it's foreordained or planned. Because Christ on Good Friday brings a solution to humanity's greatest failure. In Genesis chapter 3, we get this concept of the fall. Humanity falls. What does that mean? What does it mean for humanity to fall? We fall from our position of authority on the, in the world that Christ originally placed humanity in because of temptation and therefore fall from our position, fall into sin, and fall into death. That's why in verse 19, God says, to Adam and Eve, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Between Genesis 1 and 2, Adam and Eve were never designed to die. Genesis 3 occurs, and they fall from their position. And now they are introduced to death. In Genesis 1 and 2, they get warned about death. And they are warned in how to avoid it. They don't listen to the word of God because they think they know better and they're tricked and tempted into doing so. We all know the story of what the world depreciates as the talking snake, right? How many of you guys have heard it planted in that way? You guys believe about a talking snake talking to a woman and trying to convince. Well, if the Bible is true, that talking snake brought humanity down to its knees and brought death and sin into the world. And so immediately humanity suffers the consequences of this fall. For instance, in Genesis chapter 5, it's literally a chapter of death. If you read and you see all the names in Genesis chapter 5, you're going to read, and he died. Verse 8, and he died. Verse 11, and he died. Verse 14, and he died, etc., etc., etc. Lots of names are mentioned and lots of death is mentioned. The only person that doesn't die in chapter 5 is Enoch. But everyone else, death. Because that's the consequence of sin. And then, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, we get this understanding of great wickedness. A people that were so involved in their sexual immorality, so involved in themselves, seeking the pleasure for themselves, that God called this a great wickedness and therefore had to bring a flood over the world 
to purify it. Yes, we do believe that a flood occurred. Now again, I am fully aware that from the outside looking in, people can look at us and say, do you really believe that there was this boat like the Titanic and animals walked in pairs? Like, really, bro? That, that's what you really believe? And you want me to go to church to believe that? It's hard. I get it. And I understand completely that on the natural level, it is ridiculous. Paul would say this later on, that the message of the gospel is ridiculous for everyone. But yes, we do believe that there was a flood. We do believe in this little boat or mega boat that, that, that Noah built with his own two hands and brought in all the animals because God needed to purify the world from its wickedness. If anyone could do it, God can. And God needed to purify the world. He brought the flood. And then after the flood, there was this wonderful opportunity to start over. How many of you guys like that wonderful opportunity to start over? Start fresh. Either a new relationship, a new job, a new career. You start over and you have this wonderful opportunity to get things right. Well, humanity doesn't get things right. One of the first actions that we read with Noah, especially in Genesis, in, in, in these chapters between chapter 6 and chapter 9, is that Noah gets drunk. Here we have the first man that parties a little bit too hard and gets drunk after God has rescued him. His sons make fun of him. His sons laugh at him. And then they are cursed. And then we also get this concept of human ingenuity of human brilliance at the forefront by the time we get to Genesis chapter 11 we have the hubris effect of humanity we are big we are strong nothing can compare to us so let's build a tower a monument to fulfill our ego they called it the tower of Babel so that they could become like God see God's grace was over everybody at that time. When God chose Israel with Abraham and his descendants, it was in the middle of this chaos. It wasn't because they were good. It wasn't, Deuteronomy actually says that they were not good and that they were not righteous. But God chose them. And God chose to love them knowing full well they would be rebellious people. And this happens. The storyline goes on through the book of uh, through the books of, of the judges and of the kings. They, they their, their depiction of horrible events that reject God in every way by the actions of the people that God chose to save. One of the uh, most saddest verses in the book of Judges is found in chapter 21 verse 25 when it brings the state of affairs to the forefront. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. No king, no government. Everyone was basically doing as they pleased. Complete anarchy. The prophets point out the issue that people need a new heart. Religion or their sacrifices weren't doing anything because they were doing it with a proud heart. They were doing it being disobedient. None of that was going to work. And so the prophets say, you must get a new heart. And it isn't until the New Testament comes into the picture that we have Jesus speaking on these very issues. And we could talk a lot more about what the prophets say in the Old Testament. But come the New Testament, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 23, a very famous verse and description of Jesus is that he is weeping over Jerusalem, calling it the city that kills prophets and stones those who are sent. And then he says in, 30, in verse 38, your house is left desolate. He weeps and he mourns over Jerusalem, Jerusalem. But prior to that, he repeats a significant number of woes. 
Woe to you. Woe to you. Like, shame on you. Shame on you for following corruption. Shame on you for being involved in hypocrisy and dead religion. Jesus warns these people. Jesus sees the issue again from Genesis chapter 3. It keeps going. It doesn't stop. It gets worse. Peter, after Jesus ascends into his rightful place of authority, Peter preaches his first sermon to the New Testament people that would soon be the New Testament church. And he says to them in verse chapter 2 of Acts, verse 40, save yourselves from this crooked generation. The world was crooked, filled in sin, and they needed salvation. Sin after the fall, what it did bring was this impending doom. God was offended. Sin offended God. So though we would like to fast forward to this moment of celebration come Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, the way it's known in the Bible, though we want to fast forward to this wonderful celebratory event, we have to first understand that humanity brought an offense to God. And God was offended. And so therefore God responds to this offense. Do you think God would just simply lay back and be like, Okay, do what you want. It's cool. Don't worry. I love you guys. No. God responds. He responds. He responded to the wickedness in Genesis chapter 6 with a flood. And then he will respond once more to the great wickedness of our time. If you look around in our modern day, are things getting better? Are things good? Are things okay in our world? I mean, I don't even turn on the news and I know what's going on. I don't even have social media and I know what's going on. It's insane to see how the world isn't getting any better. People killing people for no apparent reason. Just because of their skin color or their nationality. People fleeing countries, trying to come for a better life within our country, being caged up. I mean, people in other parts of the world that are still struck with hunger and disease. I mean, it's, friends, it's, it's not getting any better. Unless you live in a bubble somewhere, you're, we're not, there's like, it doesn't seem like there's going to be a happy ending. The Bible speaks on this. For example, the Bible brings the solution to this, but not by some happy-go-lucky ending. For instance, the Apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The same way God responded to Noah's time is the same way God's going to respond to our modern culture and our modern world. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus is going to deliver us. We're going to get to that. Who's us? What does that mean? We're going to get to that soon. But Jesus is in charge of delivering us from this wrath. Hence, the reason for wiping and washing away our sins. If we are to experience God's wrath, it is because we have not been saved by Jesus Christ. So the modern problem that we face nowadays is that 
all of this is brushed aside. There's a diminishing of this concept of sin. There is some sort of like, oh, this is nonsense. Religion is nonsense. All religion does is take your money and instill fear in you. All religion does is kill in the name of God. That's all religion serves to do. We have this found in the 17th century between uh, Jean Locke and Jean Jacques Rousseau, who, who were these enlightened thinkers that thought that simply by behavioral modifications, we could make the world better. It was Rousseau who had this concept of culture that says the only reason why we're bad is because civilization has brought norms and rules and regulations if we just simply live without rules then nothing would be bad no one would be breaking rules if rules didn't exist and so a lot of social experiments started happening like socialism and communism to try to fix the problem of the world but we all saw how that ended up in our world, the same story continues to play out. Efforts to fix society's evils come by way of social reform, reconstructed history, and the destruction of hierarchies and authority. That's our solution to the problem. We could fix it. All we got to do is reverse or re-engineer our society. We can make this better, folks. We can make this world a better place. Just got to scream a little bit louder, protest a little harder, and make sure that we are heard. Salvation from this world's evils then will rest on humanity. We have the answer to this problem. But in essence, it's a diminishment of sin and the actual reason why we're in the predicament we're in causes sin. Sin is this declaration of independence from creature with God. The more you sin and enjoy it, the more you declare your independence. In a way, the United States has declared its independence from God and from Jesus Christ. We're free. We're free from these oppressive acts of religion. We can live and enjoy our lives and be good people and enjoy the outcome and work of our labor. Sin is no more. And when sin is no more, then there is no reason for a Savior. Why would we need to be saved if there's nothing to be saved from? If we are going to be saved and if we are going to make this world a better place, we could do this by a collab, a collaboration of all of us getting together to overcome the world's evils by combining the world's good. We can do this. We could overcome. We could get to the other side. It all rests on our ability to do good. But as we've seen, we don't have to be blind or we don't have to have lived that much to understand that every time the world tried to fix the issue, things just kept getting worse. Five, five to four hundred years of modern civilization, and instead of getting better, we're getting worse. So how do we get rid of this problem? So how do we fix the issue? Well, the Bible says that there is no remediation for the issue of our world. As a matter of fact, we just read that the world will come to its final destruction by God because it has offended God for the very last time. The book of Romans, Paul says that the creation itself is groaning for a renewal. Creation itself wants to be freed from the corruption of this world. And so for this, there's a plan. And so the reason Good Friday then exists and the reason we're gathered in a way to commemorate this wonderful night of, of, of sacrifice is because within God's plan, the only way we can escape impending doom, the only way we can escape the effects of death and sin over our life is by what God planned to do. And who he planned to do it with. 
So after our first representative, Adam and Eve, as, as they fail, failed miserably, God needed to bring a new Adam and bring in a new Redeemer, a new co-regent, which was Jesus Christ. It's interesting to see that even Adam and Eve try to fix the problem of sin with their own hands. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 that when they realized that they sinned God, they saw that they were naked. And what was the first thing they tried to do? They tried to cover themselves. And they made for themselves clothing out of fig leaves to try to cover themselves. But God, even when they sinned and failed and horrified God by their actions, God came in and covered them. With leather garments. Yes, friends, even when we offend God, there is still forgiveness of sins. There is still this attribute of God that claims love, grace, and compassion. And so instead of God deleting humanity, he demonstrated compassion to them. And when they couldn't fix their problem, God covered them with new garments. And so God is doing the same thing over again with humanity. He brings in a new Adam, which we know as Jesus Christ, the perfect person, perfect in obedience that comes to God and does the job that you and I could never do. As a matter of fact, the New Testament enters into depiction with the book of Matthew when it presents that she will bear a son talking about Mary, and she and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. His job description is flat out there. There is no confusion on what Jesus will do. He's not just here. He didn't just come to give us a moral example of how to be good people, of how to care for other people. Not just simply that. Jesus comes and there is a depiction of his job description that says he will save the people from their sins. Friends, the problem is that you and I are sinners. That's the issue here. And until we realize that before a holy God, we're never going to amount to anything else in our spiritual life if we think that we could do this on our own. I don't need religion. I don't need church. And I don't need to waste my time on Sunday morning if I am my own savior. If nothing is wrong. And the world has lived in that way for so long. So come Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, people would prefer to unwrap chocolate-covered eggs and enjoy their 100-calorie treat rather than to come and know what the blood of Jesus Christ did. They rather enjoy their sweet chocolate than the sweet aroma of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, as we said earlier, was no victim. It wasn't, as we say in Spanish, pobrecito, poor Jesus, who had to go to the cross because people like us just couldn't get it right. No, not poor Jesus. Jesus knew what he came to do. Jesus walked and lived in a manner with one mission in mind. And nothing was going to deter him from that mission. Nothing was going to get in the way of fulfilling his mandate. He said the Son of Man came to, to serve, not to be served, and give his life as a ransom for many. He said to his disciples, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. And then Jesus says this in the Gospel of John, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Jesus lays down his life, not as a victim, but as a savior. 
as a sweet sacrifice for the cleansing of sin. And in doing so, what he does is fulfill his obedience to God as the perfect man, which you and I could never do. In doing so, he gives himself as a propitiation, which in, in its basic level is a substitution and an appeasement of wrath. That sword that is depicted for you and me, that wrath of God that is still very much so here and impending over us, that wrath that was supposed to be for us, Jesus takes it upon him so that you and I will never have to experience that again. See, this is why we look forward to the hope of salvation being in Jesus Christ. Leaving this world because this world has nothing to offer. What are we going to be happy about? A better car? More money? A better career? What about the people that kill themselves and they have all those things? None of that will ever satisfy. None of that will ever be the dream that we can finally be happy. I am finally happy sitting in my 20,000 square foot mansion up on Beverly Hills. That's never going to be the case. It isn't until we're sitting before the throne of God, known that we've been forgiven. Known, knowing that we've been clean. Knowing that that sin over your life, that that fall that we've inherited can never be taken away by our efforts. doesn't matter how much money we have. We cannot pay for our freedom from sin. It had to be paid for on a cross kind of like that one. It had to be paid for by a perfect human being who lived as a savior, who lived with a purpose to live perfectly for us, to take on God's punishment, take on God's wrath for people like you and me. So that one day, friends, if the Bible is true, when you and I stand before God, we've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, can hear those beautiful words, come in good and faithful servant. All because the wonderful love of Jesus Christ suffered for us in our place. He knew he would be rejected. He knew he would be beaten. And he knew he would be murdered, but it didn't deter him. He was willing to be reproached so that we could be glorified when he was diminished. When Christ suffered an embarrassing death, he did so so that you and me, you, all of us here, can live a life, freedom of condemnation and live glorified with the Father. That is why we celebrate Good Friday. And that is why we're here as people that can recognize this wonderful fact that Jesus Christ came to die in order that we wouldn't have to. So that we can stand before God free from sin. Amen? Amen. Why don't we stand up today? Give God a round of applause just to make some noise tonight. We're happy that you were able to, to make it. And uh, is Pastor Henry, you're here, Henry? If, if, if there is any question, any concern, anything you may want to speak a little bit more about from this perspective on why Jesus Christ came... Henry will be here. I will be here after the service. We have another service coming in right now, the Spanish service. So if you want more clarity and you want to make fun of me a little bit because of how I speak in Spanish, come and join us again so you could hear the message all over again. Uh, and and we could, we're going to be doing this in Spanish. But it's great to see you guys here. Let's end this night in prayer. And Henry and I will be up front just lingering to see if anybody wants to speak about what you just heard. Let's pray. Father. What else can we say? What else can we do? Reality, there's nothing. 
We live here by grace. We are alive by your pure grace and patience. We are alive and breathing because you see fit. And Father, you've offered us this opportunity to listen to the main reason why Jesus Christ came and died. He was not a victim. He came with a purpose for us. So I pray, Father, that this church and the people that are here right now listening to this very gospel, listening to these very words that even your son, Jesus Christ, says, that he comes to lay down his life for many, Father, that we can react, be awakened by the words of Jesus, so that we can stop living a life of sin and come into your fold. Bring your sons and daughters to your fold. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great night, folks.